Morning, everybody. Morning. Uh, so welcome to our session on the, you know, discussing what it's like running a public cloud on OpenStack. And uh, so I'm Troy Toman from Rackspace. And uh, while I was a big part of running the public cloud, uh, or at least uh, putting a team together to do that at Rackspace, I'm your moderator today for this session. And uh, I thought we'd do a quick introduction from each one of you. So uh, Matt, if you want to introduce yourself real quick and then we'll run through some questions. Sure, so I'm, I'm Matt Van Winkle. I'm a, a manager of engineering from Rackspace. So I tend to call myself the cloud server's whipping boy around the company, so that's kind of why I'm here. I'm Topher White and I've been operating HP's public cloud for a couple of years now. I'm Jonathan LaCour. I'm the vice president of cloud at DreamHost and we are building uh, Dream Compute, which is an OpenStack public cloud. I'm Mick Barset. I work for Innovance. We help um, a couple public clouds, uh, CloudWatt being the, the most known one, uh, operate their cloud. So, um, Jonathan, you proposed this one, this one, so I'll let you take the first stab at it. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I always tell the people a story at the Essex Summit when I uh, first met the engineering VP for HP's public cloud way back when, and we realized we needed to start having every bi you know, biweekly conference calls to coordinate. And I remember after the thing was done, we were just kind of staring at each other, and we go, gosh, it feels like if our marketing guys saw this, they'd, they'd, they'd kill one of us. But we knew we had to coordinate, but we were competing in the market. So how do you, do you guys work together on, on this area? And, and you know, how's this whole operator super user thing going here at the summit? Personally, I think, you know, so yes, we do share a lot of information. We try to be really open at DreamHost. We, you know, we have no secrets. We don't hide anything. We're not afraid to share our struggles. Um, and, uh, but I don't think we do that nearly enough. I think the uh, OpenStack is fantastic, and I think the private cloud use case has just like exploded with OpenStack, and that's just been by the nature of kind of the market today. Um, but I think over, over the next, you know, if we have to really look forward for the next decade and, and two decades, um, for this project to really be hugely successful, we're gonna have to get together as operators of really large scale public clouds and, and solve some problems together, um, share those challenges as a community, and I, I think we're actually all working together. I, I love the world of uh, many public clouds, OpenStack public clouds, all working together and being willing to share um, in that market. It's a huge, huge market, and there's plenty of ways for us to differentiate and go after different kinds of customers. So we need to work together and work to be compatible with each other. So yeah, we try to share, and we need to do a lot more, a lot more. As I was gonna say, anybody else got some thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I think the, 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 the basic idea of OpenStack is that if you run on a public cloud that is running on OpenStack, you should be able to run your workload on another running on OpenStack. So us sharing uh, the technology is a fundamental uh, point of our value proposition. And our competitors are actually clouds that are not running on OpenStack. Maybe one day when OpenStack will be so popular that every cloud runs it, we'll start really fighting against each other. But right now, we are more into the idea of building a federation of cloud than fighting against each other. And Matt, I'm gonna give you a chance to make a quick plug, because I know you've been looking at uh, actually forming a public cloud user group as, a, as opposed to a geographically oriented user group. So I don't know if you wanna mention a little bit about that and give a chance to recruit anybody who right. might be interested so in that. Right, so I've already hit these guys up via email and planning for the session. Um, I know anyone who's around for the operator uh, pieces tomorrow, I think 11.40 is a session on kind of user governance. Um, and I think uh, some of the, the in, Initial feedback I've gotten there is they're, they're still going to retain kind of the, the, the user committee structure, but try to augment it with, with some working groups. So I think there's going to be a nice, happy collision there of sort of the opportunity to develop a public cloud um, group of folks who are sort of collectively coming back to the community and not telling people how things should be done, but being able to sort of articulate where things don't work well in a public cloud use case. I think, you know, Jonathan and I were just talking about a simple one. You know, Nova computes not being somewhat idempotent is a problem in a public cloud because you do often have to restart many of these things to, to implement an, up, an upgrade or a, a rollout. And so you're basically impacting customers every time you do that. So, so those kinds of, of, of suggestions and feedback that we can collectively sort of articulate would be, I think, hugely important. And so I, I'm, I'm expecting to get some traction on that here pretty quick uh, and hopefully already have some fruit produced by, uh, by Paris. Okay. 
Um, Topher, I was just get, love to get your perspective. I mean, you've been you know one of the earlier public clouds and in, in, in getting into this. At least the HP has. Um, what's what's kind of the thing that keeps you up to, at night? You know, trying to run a, a public sc scale cloud. I mean, what, I'm sure there's a long list of them. But if you had to kind of jump into it, is it you know is it deployments? Is it you know scaling issues? The combination of everything? Uh, it, stability. And the the interesting thing is you never know what's going to not be stable next. So um, it, looking across two years, I can, I can look at periods where I said, wow, uh, Nova was just such a problem in, for these three months. And we got that stabilized and, everything, and, we, and we got a chance to take a breath and then it was something else and then it was something else. And the, the challenge, I think, the thing that keeps me up at night is um, working with uh, folks uh, in the development organization who are not used to what it means to be an operator. And um, when you're relying on them to be able to fix things and, and having to drive them, and be able to say, you know what, that's great, that's a wonderful discussion that we're having, but I need this back up. <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to add something? <clears throat> you just hit a, a really good chord for me. I think, I think the game of stability whack-a-mole that you play as, as a public cloud provider, you know, you're constantly, it's like, well, what are you currently struggling with? Well, <coughs> excuse me. ask me that question over a 12-month period, and I can say, Cinder, Neutron, Nova, I could list every project, because, and it's not that the projects are bad at all, but I do think the, an interesting thing is at these summits, we all come together, and the developers all sit around and talk about features. And that's wonderful and outstanding, and we have a long way to go to get to feature parity with the big guys, right? Um, but frankly, I would love it if we had a summit where the primary focus was just, what can we make work better? How can we make this more stable? How can we make this scale? I mean, there are projects right now that are core projects in OpenStack where you can only run a single worker. I mean, that's maddening to, to someone like me because you have to figure out all sorts of insane workarounds to, to, to make things scale. And it's not because the software is bad, it's because they didn't think about this, right? And, oh, this works, now let's go do a feature. Well, how about we make everything scale as well as it can? So that would be my big kind of push as an operator to the developers at the summit is, let's just make everything work better for a while. Be have, awesome. have you had a chance to be involved with like either the operator mini summit in March or any of the operator conversations here? Have those helped at all? Or are, they, are we moving in the, a better direction? So, so my operator team goes to, to those things. And the great thing is you're with a bunch of other operators who all sit around and commiserate with one another. And that's fantastic. But I think the key thing is I actually would prefer it if it wasn't operators meeting with each other and developers meeting with each right. other. It would be really good for everyone to meet with each other because those kind of goals are a little different. I'm an, I'm an engineer by trade. I'm a, I'm a, I've written software for, for a couple decades, and, and so I get it. Like, New Shiny is fun to work on, right? Um, but you know what's even actually a lot sexier to me is making things scale. Like, that actually is a really, really cool thing. And, and um, so I think that should be the operator's message to developers. Let's, let's make this thing scale like crazy. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll interject and say that, to their credit, some of the folks really driving the, the operator efforts like Tom and, and Tim are the first to say, don't just come and say, this is crap. Absolutely. But, but come and tell us how we can help make it better. And, and you know, unfortunately, we, we, they, we pulled off getting the extra things into this summit, but unfortunately, we had two months to do it. So I, I think there were sessions, DevOps sessions, we called them, in all the products. The Nova one is tomorrow at three-ish, I think. Um, and then we're already looking at maybe doing an additional operator summit in San Antonio in August. Sorry about that, by the way. It's going to be a little warm. Um, but we're talking about the potential of maybe doing two days, specifically so we can get some either Nova cores in or maybe see if Michael can come over um, from Australia and, and, and inter interject some, some additional DevOps uh, yeah, and to be clear, I think this stuff is happening now more than it ever has. So it's not, again, it's, and it's almost never, this thing sucks. That's almost never the complaint. It's almost always, did you think about this, right? So, but yeah, you're right. We're making good strides. So, um, Nick, I'll let you take a shot at this because I know you've worked with a couple of different folks, but um, you know, I think the other challenge running a public cloud is sort of how do you, 
how do you, you know how do you decide what to deploy right you know there's the six month release cycles there's the one month milestones there's people that talk about trunk what has your guys experience been with in terms of how you deploy in the public cloud and then I'd, I'd love to get input from the rest from the other panel members so uh, our philosophy is to remain unstable but keep stay uh, as close to the latest patches to stable as possible um, we decided not to uh, go to a deployment from trunk um, because we think st stabilization adds value and it helps keeping the, the stuff running. Now, what's really important for us is having the ability to test more and more of the scenarios so that we are forewarned when we apply a new patch, what is going to be the consequence of it. Are we going to need to uh, do a rolling upgrade on this? or are we going to have uh, some downtime? Um, this, is, this is the most important uh, part for us at the moment, being able to foretell. And this is knowledge we are trying to build into our CI to test more and more of the scenarios so that we can confidently push what I call the big red button of deployment. <laughs> okay. We um, have again, like, likewise, been very focused on keeping stable but reasonably current. Um, the challenge that we've run into is uh, developing a process that we feel allows us to safely deploy um, and uh, how you deploy across regions, across availability zones, how much bake time you give it. Because interestingly, there are some really neat bugs that don't show up in tests, they, it doesn't until they bake for a while and suddenly start decomposing. Um, so we have to balance, uh, if I take a look at a very large deployment, we may want to spread over a couple of weeks. Um, that's not something that you then take every day. Um, and so we've tried to size around when we take things being a function of how much, how long it's going to take to deploy it and how often we want to do that and letting that be a, a pretty good dictator of uh, how quickly we take things off a of trunk. So I would say we would like to be trunk chasers. I think we're not as close as we would like to be. We typically fall in a couple months out. Um, We've learned, though, that the longer you wait to pull, the harder it is. So it actually turns out to be better to, to move faster. Um, if anyone was here yesterday, our deployment folks actually gave a pretty good rundown over the last six months of what we've improved on and what we still have to improve on. Uh, I think, though, we take a lot of the same approaches in how we push it out as far as deciding which regions to go to first based on size and complexity and, and letting them sit there for a while and, and making sure, um, you know, either there's not a bug that decays and shows up or I think my favorite one was still last year when we deployed to a reasonably good sized region and suddenly we were surprised by a phenomenal increase in database traffic across a load balancer. And you know, so it's things like that that we find. And so we take that real similar approach of we're gonna go here first and we're gonna wait. And then we're gonna go here and we're gonna wait and, and obviously adjust as we learn from those, those particular deployments. So yeah, I think I'll echo a lot of what you guys have been saying. You know, we, we have the ability to chase trunk um, and for some things we do. Uh, and for other things, we just try to stay on a stable version as much as possible. And I think it really depends on the particular features that we're trying to provide to our customers and kind of the decisions we've made. Um, so, you know, for, for things like Glance, you know, stable's great for us. You know, we don't, there's not a whole lot we have to deal with there. But for things like Neutron, on the other hand, you know, we're, we would love to, well, I'm not sure if say we would love to chase trunk on Neutron, but um, <laughs> we, we may need to chase trunk on Neutron, right? And uh, so for us, it's all about being able to automate the pulling from any branch, anywhere, any place, any time, and building a package and sticking that into our staging clusters and just hammering them with the CI, right? So, um, but in an ideal world, I would love it if we could all be on a stable. I would love that. That just sounds fantastic to me. But, um, you know, I think having the ability to chase trunk is important probably for us. So, um, I sort of heard this theme running through almost each of the answers, which is you've built a CI and a test system to give you some confidence. Have you been working or do you have ideas on how to get some of that testing capability further upstream so that, because I know it always feels to us like sometimes we're doing an awful lot of debugging in our test after things that come out of the supposed 
CI system, because um, you, you find out you know things on DevStack are a lot different in, yes. out in the real world. Um, and uh, what, so, what are your thoughts on, on, on either the opportunity there or uh, what you got, what you'd like to do there? So, for for DreamHost, I think the interesting thing is we would love to be all running probably the same CI, right? The same tests, at least as a foundation, right? Um, and there is a, a place for that. There's Tempest out there. And uh, I think the interesting problem for us right now is that we're still, you know, OpenStack is still in its infancy. Um, you know, and I'm looking on a long, large, you know, time span. I expect Open, OpenStack to be around for many, many, many years. Um, and if we actually polled each other on what versions and which projects were actually running, I'm pretty sure we all would give completely different answers. And so for us, it's very, very difficult to share those tests today. But I think if we're all starting to converge and start deploying all the same projects as these you know, projects reach more maturity for our use case, eventually, yes, I want to upstream all, all of it you know, as much as possible. Right now, I just don't think it's actually possible. Um, I could be wrong on that. I'd love to be told I'm wrong, but I don't think it's possible yet. So um, as we're obviously up here having a, a lot of things that we can talk about, but for anybody that's got questions for the panel, um, we've got the mics, and I'm happy to start um, doing some of those. So it looks like we've got one over here. If we don't have people the mics, that's not a problem. I think we've got several things we can bring up, but um, Rain, you want it? You go ahead. So I have a, a couple of things. It's very interesting what you're talking about not being um, possible right now to share because I agree, and I've been talking a lot with Monty Taylor and the infrastructure team about that right now we're at a point where we're always going to need CI and we can't really go all the way to CD until we get into a downstream application. Um, if you come today at 1.30, I think either this room or next room, we're going to talk some about the Rackspace use cases. Um, but the main, the main question I had was um, about explaining to a developer what it is to be an operator. Um, I have a unique opportunity to kind of be in both worlds a lot with where I work in the deploy and release engineering area. Um, and, and for example, I was I asked some devs at Rackspace, how many how many hosts nodes do you think a, an admin operator at Rackspace is responsible for? And the answer was 50. Oh no, it's probably higher than that, 250. And the answer is closer to 800 to 2,000, depending on how you how you count your nodes and which 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 ones you're talking about. And their jaws are just dropping. Um, so I would love to hear any ideas you all have about how to explain the the stress and the complexity that it is to be an operator, to be an engineer. Because then when you, when you get to the engineer's level, it's double. It, it doubles that. Um, so I would, I would like, I, I think that's a lot of what's missing right now in the conversation is this is what it's like to be me, and this is what it's like to be me, and let's, let's put it together. And I like that conversation, so ideas on how to help make that happen. So I don't know. I, I think the, the, the DevOps movement has a clear answer to that make the developers operator once in a while. They'll, they, they'll know what it is to suffer uh, from maintaining the environment. Um, it, it's really important that um, at, even if a developer is best used at developing, uh, that they at least sometimes share the pain. An idea um, is to regroup um, the ops and the dev team around specific areas. Uh, another is to organize cycles where devs would join ops team for a while. But uh, I think it's really fundamental uh, for the, the, the two to be really talking all the time. And if our devs' uh, main focus is not to satisfy the needs of the ops, then I'm wondering who are uh, uh, the devs' customers. I think that a lot of people uh, sometimes focus on having the devs uh, share the pain when there's a problem or when there's an outage. Um, what I found has been very, very interesting is getting the developers involved in the idea of repeated routine things that have to be done. And where we've done this really well at HP is around compliance, where we have all kinds of compliance audit requirements and pushing them on the devs and say, you know what, by the first of every month, you have to do all of these log reviews. You have to do all of these access reviews. You have to do, and you, and it has to be right, and you have to provide evidence, and you have to do this, and it's every month, every time. And that starts to give them these, an idea of the scope of what they're having to deal with, um, and realizing that 
the decisions they make or the tools they provide or don't provide have an impact beyond just something's up or something's down. It can either make something an awful lot of work or very little work. And, and that has been a place that I think has been fantastic. Well, I do think um, we do a disservice in this whole conversation around DevOps because um, you know, everything we've just been talking about and even the question that popped up around this is really about communication and understanding. Um, and I think that the noise in the press and the noise in the marketing around DevOps is like, oh, DevOps is Ansible, DevOps is, uh, is operators who can write Python code, DevOps is, and it's like, no, actually DevOps is exactly what we just sat here and talked about, which is how do you get operators and developers to have empathy um, and understanding of what the others are going through. So that, you know, and I've, I've watched this for years, this mindset that says, okay, developers write code, they throw code over the wall to operators. Operators have to take it, they have to band-aid stuff around it, do a whole bunch of other things to make it live and survive, and there's never communication back. That those band-aids never get told to developers. It's not like they don't they don't they know about them and don't want to deal with them. It's just, you know, and I think breaking those walls down really is the essence. And that leads to tools like, you know, Salt and Ansible and Puppet and Chef, but but that is not that is not, that's an outcome, not the actual process to get there. For us, I think one of the, the best ways that we've achieved that empathy is by ensuring something that Nick was alluding to, who is your customer, right? So the, our product manager for, for our public cloud ensures that the operators are in many ways the customers of the developers and the customer of the public cloud is the customer of the operator. So it's kind of this layered approach to the problem. And uh, I think my devs spend almost all of their time working on making the operator's lives not hell. That's basically their, that's like, as an operator, I can sleep at night with, so I can not die. You know, whatever it is, that's the, that's the user story that is in every sprint for the developer, so, uh, or the epic, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would say like, I would probably say that we're kind of an exception in that, you know, we have big enough organizations that we have operations teams sitting, quote unquote, next to development teams that are working upstream and we have a regular interaction. I think, I think Rainier had a really good point about, you know, as a community, as operators, we have to tell a better story. Um, you know, if someone came to me to, as a developer and said, look, this thing has a one in 1,000 chance of breaking, I'd be like, okay, well, that's pretty good. You know, but if I turn around and told them, well, in my smallest region, that means that five customers are having a problem right now, that's a different story. Um, and so I think you, you touched on the word empathy. I think, you know, look, the balance is going to shift as open tech stack continues to mature. That's not bad, you know, but it's going to go from this, this really cool project that a lot of devs got excited about and jumped in to work on to production software being run in a number of use cases, being driven by the demands of those people using it. And the people with those demands have to be as empathetic to how developers think and work and what they need to be productive as they need to be to the people running the software. Um, so let's, uh, you know, I'd be curious just to get a take, and just because I know, you, you know, you can probably do a good job at this, and I'd love to get everybody to weigh in, but what's a day in the life of, of Matt Van Winkle at Rackspace? I mean, what, what kind of, you know, give us an example of one of those crazy days where maybe you had some plans and things go the other way, and how did you have to deal with that? You mean like every day? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, look, it, it's, It really is, it can be some of the most maddening stuff in the world, and yet it, it's incredibly fun. Um, you know, I typically have a plan every day of all the projecty stuff I'm supposed to get done um, that I probably got up at 5.30 or 6 o'clock to get started on um, before taking the kids to school. Um, but pretty much, you know, the day is pretty much interrupt-driven all day long. And, and whether that's an, a specific problem going on in a, in a particular region with a particular service, um, or, you know, Rainia sits right next to me and she tries to filter it, but there's a pretty much a constant stream of walk-ups. Hey, this customer has this problem. Hey, this, this thing isn't working over here. Hey, what are we doing about this? Hey, we need more gear in this and so, region. And so how do you structure, I mean, you, you mentioned sort of Rainia's there. And I mean, right. Like just what's the general structure of, of groups and teams that are working on this, uh, this operational and support stack that you Right, got? so we have, a, we have an operations team that is, is a mixture of admins and engineers that is really trying to center around the day-to-day -day sort of small firefighting, this service needs a restart, this, this thing's alerting, um, this host is down, bring it back up. Um, my team is sort of shifting into a, 
uh, a model where we're looking at how do we then go start to take a lot of this interruptible, painful stuff from the data plane and make it hands off, whether it's adding capacity, uh, moving customers out of harm's way uh, with things like live migrate, those kinds of things. Um, and then on top of that, you have several teams within the company that are doing development where we're regularly interacting with their managers um, to give as real-time feedback as possible to what we're seeing. And then you've got like a few thousand support people on top of that that are that, sort of, that, I mean, you got you got alerts coming in from, from systems, you got alerts right. coming in from support and customers, right. and kind of jamming all that together. Exactly, and so, so we're looking at services that actually, you know, filter the alerts down to only the stuff that a service can't deal with so that we can, we can continue to scale the cloud without having to hire, you know, thousands of people just to run it, because I'd rather us hire people to go help support customers trying to use it. Okay. Um, Similar, different sort of structural approaches? I mean, is that, does it all ring a bell with everybody, or? Yeah. Um, the, uh, we're in a fairly, I think, typical structure of, of we have a knock that is uh, getting the alerts in, and then they have a succession of teams that they're going to escalate through. Um, a, a day in the life, I think what's interesting um, is when you start getting to significant scales, things like the MTBF on hardware starts to come into play of, um, sure, that, you know, that drive's only going to fail once every two years, but when you've got 10,000 of them, mm -hmm. you, you've got five drive swaps a day. Well, talk a little doing. bit about that, because, you know, we talk scale, and I think we always think, we, we sort of know what we mean by scale, because we live here, but I'm not sure if everybody else does. Like, what does scale look like for you guys? Um, I mean, for, without detailed numbers, but I mean, just yeah, sort of orders it, of magnitude kind of thing. Um, uh, between uh, dev and production, uh, I'm running somewhere just under 7,000 servers right now. Um, and, uh, and I know a lot of folks uh, are probably going to think that's actually quite small. <laughs> yeah, so we are, it's interesting, I actually really love this panel because we have very different, you know, you guys are, are coming from a very, very large scale, you, your scale dwarfs ours, but we're still, I still consider what we're doing scale. Um, because we're seeing some of the same issues, right? And, and I think there's a threshold, and I don't know what that threshold is, but we're certainly past it. Um, and, and in terms of day in the life, for us, we're also in a bit of a different situation because we're still iterating towards a final product. You guys are out there. Kudos. Um, we're, we're, we're still iterating towards a final product. We're in product beta. Too. I'm we're sure you guys are still iterating as well. Moving, yeah. um, but since we're in beta, so our, the day in the life at DreamHost for Dream Compute is uh, we have um, the first thing every morning before we get into our sprint, our sprint meeting is we basically have our CI that's just absolutely hammering our clusters, just beating them up, spinning up VMs and destroying them all day, all the time. And we're measuring everything from how long it took to boot, how long it took to cloud in it, how long it took to SSH into it, does it then continue to respond, so on and so forth. And we um, get an email in our inbox every morning that's automated that says, Here's how bad it is today. I hate right? that email. Yeah. And so um, that information, in addition to the testers, that feedback is coming in all the time. And so our entire day is driven by, now we have a sprint plan, right? Um, but depending on what happens, you know, it, we, may have, we may have a two weeks where, or a week where we have, you know, things are all passing. You know, we're getting 99.9x percent of, of everything is just working. We may have weeks where we're down in, in the 80s. Um, and that's been getting better and better. Um, so it depends. If, if we're down on our tests or are we hearing stuff from customers, that's all we're doing, fixing stuff, interrupt-driven, just like you said. Um, but I've got, I don't have a whole lot of teams to coordinate with. I have five total people working on the public cloud. Total people, five. Um, Engineering-wise, I've got a product manager in, in QA we, as well. We, we do appreciate your um, time here. This 40 minutes is a big <laughs> deal then. That's right. I'm sure my leg is vibrating with uh, issues. Actually. So. Um, yeah, it's a little bit different for us, but that's what a day in life is for me. And Nick, you guys are actually sort of working with companies that are building their own public clouds, so that's interesting. You've got, you kind of got multiple public clouds that you're, you're working after. Oh, I can only testify about what their operational day is like, but one of the things we've um, helped them uh, put in place is KPI. And uh, it's very interesting to build a list of all the indicators that shows whether your cloud is going well or not. Um, and when you do so, you then present a dashboard, which is going to be the heartbeat, the, thing that, the first thing that you look at when you wake up in the morning, and the last thing you look at when you go to bed. 
because more than specific incident, as soon as you go to scale, what is important is trends. Um, if you s just deploy the new update and this update has some unforeseen consequences, you want to be watching those trends um, to, to detect uh, the, the problem and fix it before it's uh, you know, a, a storm. Um, so any other questions from the audience? Any, anything uh, you're curious to hear about, maybe about the details, what goes on in the public cloud? Hi, guys. Um, I was interested to know, does the panel foresee a point down the track uh, wherein all the companies that we represent focus less on being, say, a cloud for everyone um, and instead look at some specialization for different use cases? Uh, obviously, AWS dominates uh, at, this, at the moment from a cloud as commodity perspective. Uh, but Troy, in your keynote the other day, you were talking about OpenStax power uh, being harnessed and that can be tuned for different purposes, uh, all talking to one another. So like a healthcare cloud that's HIPAA compliant, uh, something that's retail oriented for Magento, uh, something for big data that CERN uses, for example. So, so I think yes. I think you know, Jonathan touched on that too with the breadth of, of the potential customer bases out there. However, um, I think at this point in, in evolution, we probably still want to get to the point where some very large customer who can only deploy on something like an Amazon today because of their breadth and scale chooses to come deploy on everyone sitting up here because we've made OpenStack work that well universally. You know, I think we want that, and then we can start to look at how else can we differentiate um, for different customer bases. But I think OpenStack, the product, needs needs that global cloud that spans Rackspace, HP, DreamHost, et cetera, Enovitz, all of Enovitz's e e customers um, first, because then we've really built a product that rivals those, those proprietary clouds that are out there. I think it's certainly possible that you're going to eventually see that kind of specialization in public cloud. I'm really hearing about those use cases in private cloud. Uh, I think folks are much more interested in um, how they do, whether it's finance or healthcare or stuff, they're very wary, wary of public cloud, and but very interested in talking about, um, uh, I'm, I'm a healthcare provider, how do I deploy OpenStack in a way that um, I can control, that I can be HIPAA compliant, that fits into the processes that I already have for those things. Um, will it happen in public cloud? I think eventually, um, but I think we're going to take a lot of lessons out of the folks doing it in private to be able to figure out what that means. So uh, as we are trying to um, build standardized pods for different use cases, um, we, we've seen that there, we are really working on uh, two axes. Uh, there is a cost versus performance, and there is a density access. Um, if you, well, we simplified the, the, the problem by identifying six blocks, types of pods that we need to implement in order to solve what we think is all the use cases, but we might be wrong. We haven't finished completing this, <laughs> this grid yet. Um, and. You know, when you're going to be running HPC workloads, you're going to want to have uh, almost no overcome it. When you're going to be running big data, it's the same thing on CPU because you know that when the, 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 the map reduce request is going to hit, it is going to be 100% processor. When you're doing NFV, this is a mix. Some CPU are going to be very, very uh, high, and some others are going to be sitting idle. When you're doing web, well, the processor doesn't count much, et cetera, et cetera. So we hope that by um, creating specialized uh, pods, we will be able to address 
um, the, these various needs and translate that into flavors that address those needs. And but I, I think, think Amazon has a very similar approach. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's uh, maybe an interesting point where you, the rest of you could touch on, because I, I know the challenge with that is everybody wants all this specialization, but how do you, you know, that also introduces massive complexity. I mean, it's, it's one thing to run, I know, you know, in our case, you know, if several thousand servers when, when they're all the same, but now if you start saying, well, I've got thousands and thousands of servers that I'm running, I know, by the way, I've got, you know, six different models cut into 15 different flavors, I mean, that, that adds complexity, capacity issues. How do, you know, talk about that as a challenge, because I think that's another problem in the public cloud that I see. I think just, you know, piggybacking off that and, and, and the question, I actually think, you know, for us, we actually are trying to specialize a little bit already by not, we're explicitly kind of excluding certain things as not cases we're not interested in, but we're making sure we're in looking at our own DNA and kind of the customers we're good at serving today. Our DNA is a mass market hosting company, right? We don't have, we don't target big enterprises. That's not us. We are very irreverent kind of uh, business. You know, it, we our culture and kind of our, our marketing and our brand is just not really conducive to that. So you probably won't see the DreamHost big data cloud um, or the DreamHost uh, HIPAA compliant cloud. For us, it's more about individuals and mass market. You know, very small businesses, um, teams of three to five. You know, developers writing the next big thing. That's so for us. I think we're already specializing a lot, but it's really more. It's not about a bunch of special use cases in different verticals. It's more about who's the target customer and how can we serve them really well and do it where we don't have to make a whole bunch of different pods that we have to support with a whole bunch of different complexity. We want it to be as homogenous as possible, right? Well, and I think that's probably a good contrast, Topher. You could, I mean, having talked to the HP guys, I mean, you've you got a very different positioning. So we're all running sort of, we're not running vertically industry-oriented clouds, but the HP cloud's targeted a very different user, for instance, than Jonathan was just talking about. Yes, it is. And, uh, now having, you know, being several years in, we're through several generations of hardware that we've brought in, and it becomes a very entertaining game of 3D Tetris, of um, figuring out uh, how I'm going to structure my flavors, um, where I have capacity, dear God, at the point that you're counting kilowatts, and, um, and what is, what I think is a very interesting process of this is not what we're doing in public cloud, but um, taking that experience from public cloud and going in and talking to either other organizations within HP who want to adopt OpenStack or customers who are coming in with all kinds of preconceived notions about this and saying, um, hey, I've already picked out the hardware that I want to run it on, and, uh, but I want to run OpenStack, but I want it to come in at a particular price point. And it's like, well, you've now done this completely backwards. I, I, um, want, a, I want a cheap, generic open cloud that looks exactly like this. Yes, and um, and it, it's uh, the where we have we have this great opportunity to be able to come in and say, let's start by talking about your workloads, and then how does that translate into your flavors, and then what is the, the facility that you want to put it in? What kind of density can we support? And when we have those questions, now let's start talking about hardware design. Yeah, I would say you know I live at a really interesting intersection. Um, you know, so as as the public cloud at Rackspace, we're basically a, one of the largest, or well, probably the largest dedicated hosting tenant, you know, because Rackspace sort of grew up in the dedicated hosting business. And so it's this interesting intersection where the DC is telling me, you know, I'm running out of floor space, while finance is telling me I can't get rid of old gear, while product is telling me we want to introduce three new hardware profiles next year. So, <laughs> yeah, hey Thomas. Um, so so it, it is interesting, you know, you bring that up as like, it, it's just it's not just gone from how do I make more of this, but how do I, oh, and by the way, we're running out of public IP spaces in the world. So, um, you know, how do we sort of make the giant Tetris game work? And at what point do we say this has to go and this has to come in and, and, and make all these parties happy because at the end of the day, we're all running businesses. So, so help us make IPv6 work. You know, we're, we're, you we're IPv6 all the way, so Where's on. Comcast? Aren't they a provider? Yeah, let's, come let's, on, Comcast. Let's get them. Where are you? <laughs> 
All right, well, one, I'll let each of you maybe just leave us with a couple thoughts, um, if, if you would. I think we can kind of wrap up here, but um, so take one more pass at it and drop some knowledge on us. So um, one of the things that uh, we are uh, incubating uh, at Innovans at the moment is a, a way to formalize the, the, the tests that we are doing. Um, as uh, Jonathan said, some tests uh, can be run in Tempest, and we are contributing as much as we can to Tempest tests, but there, there is more to it. Uh, you want to do uh, temp, uh, uh, upgrade testing, and Grenade does provide a little bit of that, but uh, it's not enough for the type of scale our customers are interested in. So we need to be able to formalize the information that we pass on to our customer on how to do the test and uh, allow them to increment that uh, uh, database Base with okay. their own set of tests. And um, th that's proving to be quite challenging, but um, I, I hope we have something to announce before the next summit. Great. Topher? Um, you know, for, for the longest time, um, as, as an operations staff, uh, we were heads down. You know, your, your sphere of planning is about an hour. Mm -hmm. And the OpenStack Summit was something that those devs went and did. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I am really, really proud of how, as an organization, we've driven down all the way down to, I, I have systems engineers here uh, who are production guys who are getting involved and saying, no, the way that you make this better is you have to participate and you have to participate through all the organization and at every layer and get everyone involved. John? So I'll, I'll leave with uh, just something that happened to me last night on the public cloud kind of space that I think can inspire us all a little bit. Uh, I ran into a professor of mine from Georgia Tech. I actually went to school here in Atlanta, a uh, computer science professor, and he was talking about how they were using uh, AWS in, in some of their computer science courses. And uh, I asked him um, if he could fork some of those services on GitHub. And uh, he, he kind of got it. Uh, and he got really excited about OpenStack and got really excited about um, what an open cloud can mean for education. And what we're building is we're building, um, we're building the future of, of cloud, I believe, because it's open, it's not a black box. And our future uh, engineers and the people who are building amazing things are going to be able to see exactly what makes everything tick instead of programming to APIs that they have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, I would, I would just say that, I mean, kind of the point that Topher made, I mean, organizationally it's been fun to watch in the couple of years I've been involved in the public cloud, the shift of not just the developers coming to the summits, but you know, I've got several of my amazing engineers out here in the, in the audience that really make the cloud run. But I think for me it's about what can we as public clouds on OpenStack and specifically what can I do to really help sort of drive that the Rebel Alliance mission you put out there, I mean, you, until we build the global cloud, we're, we're not in the fight to the level we want to be. And so I think this group of people and several out there and all the folks that we drag with us um, have the potential to really push that along. And so for me, it's what can we do in the next six months to a year to really solidify that. All right. Well, I, I uh, wore this shirt on purpose because we realized it probably should become the new theme shirt of the public cloud and OpenStack user group because uh, we've all survived. But um, and it's also a good day for summit shirt. So, uh, but anyway, thanks a lot for coming to join us this morning. Hope this was useful, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys around some of the rest of the day.
Good morning. How are y'all doing? There are some uncomfortable chairs in the middle right there if y'all want to find a spot or over there for the people in the back. I know how uh, wonderful those chairs are, so it's great. Um, you must be here for OpenStack Identity Federation, which is good. Um, we'd like to go ahead and start off by thanking a whole bunch of companies that actually contributed to what we've done within Ice House. Red Hat, CERN, University of Kent, I represent Rackspace with Jorge here, and IBM, Brad, and Steve. A lot, of, a lot of good companies came together when we looked at how to do identity federation, what kind of protocols we should support, how it would work from the API layer, how to implement it. And so this is a, this is a story of great collaboration, first off. So who are we? My name is Joe Savick. I'm Rackspace Identity Product Manager. We have Brad Topol, IBM Distinguished Engineer, Jorge Williams, Principal Architect with uh, Rackspace, and Steve Martinelli, uh, Keystone Core IBM Software Developer. There's a lot of other core software developers for Keystone in the room. Can you raise your hand? Thank you very much. OK, so I know it's been a little while, but how many of y'all remember on Monday when Troy presented this slide. This is a pretty cool image, isn't it? You can kind of move the scales up and down and decide the cloud that you want to go to. It's a perfect use case for a cloud broker use case, right? So if I have a workload that uh, needs to be very cost efficient but doesn't need to be that performant, I could go to the cost-oriented uh, cloud. If I want something that uh, I need the support there, I could go to the support cloud. But we have these bridges, and I don't know if you see them. We have these bridges in between the clouds, and that's kind of what we're talking about here today, is how to define those bridges in a secure way. And it starts with identity federation. So federation. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of definitions for what federation is. And again, we're concentrating on identity federation. So this is using one identity to securely access resources across multiple different clouds. Uh, so you have the endpoints across these services within your service catalog. Uh, it's maintained by a trusted identity provider. It could be your employer-provided credentials that you use. And you don't have to re-log in all the time. So uh, it enables single sign-on. Why do we want to do this? Well, whenever you provision an identity from one cloud to another cloud or from one service provider to another service provider, it's a security risk. It becomes a management nightmare as well, especially when you have a whole bunch of users over in universities or in big corporations that move in and out and, and fluid, right? How do you know that you turned off access when an employee got terminated across all services that they had access to? But I want to concentrate on, slide, on point five and six. The best test of interoperability in the cloud is to enable one identity. Without one identity working across multiple clouds, it's a big blocker. You have to be able to change your clients to be able to work with multiple tokens representing access to the different clouds. You can't burst as easily from one cloud to another cloud or from your dedicated hardware and your data center over to a public cloud. Um, so we need to be able to solve for identity federation first in order to be able to test the true interoperability. So when we talk about identity federation, there's a lot of, oh, well, do you support this protocol? Do you support that protocol? Uh, one thing I want to get uh, uh, make clear on this slide is that it's extensible. We built it to be extensible. The federation protocols, um, we have SAML within Icehouse. Um, we're, we're working on OpenID Connect. And we can also do, uh, David Chadwick, uh, you mentioned AbFab. You know, we, you can absolutely commit to that. And uh, the uh, contracts are built to be extensible to be able to handle that. R2-D2, yes. Uh, the big picture, what do we have within IceHouse? So this is, this is what IceHouse delivers. Uh, the prerequisite is uh, uh, Apache running ModShib. Many people already run Apache around Keystone today, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. And R2D2 represents kind of the employer portal or the access manager. So you would log in with your employer provided credentials into this access manager. You would be able to click on Go to Cloud. 
and it, it does a handling for you of SAML. So the SAML handshake with the identity provider and sending that information off to a Keystone cloud in order to be able to get back an unscoped token representing access to that cloud. And then you do what you normally would do at that point. You would get the projects and domains that you have access to, and you would go ahead and uh, uh, request a scope token for access to that cloud. So this is great. This enables you to be able to use your employer-provided credentials against the cloud. But that's not cloud to cloud identity federation. Before we get to that, I wanted to let you know that uh, we're kind of talking future state here. There's design sessions going on. This is kind of a, an idea that we have on how it could be implemented. It's not set in stone. There's a blueprint down there. Uh, feedback is appreciated. Um, I encourage you all to attend the design sessions or hit me up or any of the other gentlemen up here on stage with me uh, to provide feedback. So the big picture, we covered what R2D2 does, right? Well, what if you go ahead and get a token from Keystone 1 Cloud and you want to use it against Keystone 2? So you would want to be able to go ahead and send that token to Keystone 2 to provision a server. This could be for auto scale reasons. This could be for cloud bursting. It could be for cloud brokering. There's a lot of different use cases. Image portability, there's a lot of use cases that this could solve for. So how does, how does Cloud 2, Keystone 2, know that you are who you say you are, and you have access to what you say you have access to. At this point, Nova just handles it as if it was just any other token. So no change within Nova to go ahead and send that token back to the local Keystone to be able to validate the token. But at that point, there's a, a decode token origin, and I'll jump into that, where Keystone 2 defines, OK, well, this token was issued by Cloud 1, the Keystone one, and needs to go back there in order to be able to uh, validate that that is an accurate token. And there's a federation protocol handshake that happens there. You remember on the, on the other side, there was a protocol handshake in between the identity provider and R2D2. And there's now one in between Cloud2 and Cloud1. So what do, what do I mean by decode token? A uh, federated token needs to include information about where the originating authentication actually occurred. It needs to know, okay, who, where did you get this token? I need to figure out uh, if that's a, a trusted place that I could go to. And there's a trust relationship in between clouds I'll jump into here a little bit as well. One potential solution is to have this within the token metadata and includes the originating identity provider, the protocol that they support, and the subject or user that came across in the token. Um, at this point, I got to say that, uh, that I like the work that we're doing with CATF. It really supports uh, the auditing use cases that we're looking at, and it's kind of important to be able to have that um, so that way we could trace from cloud to cloud to cloud uh, what a user is actually doing. So how do tr clouds trust each other? So it's important first that clouds indicate what they support. So I support a Nova instance, or I support uh, the Swift API. So that way they could, uh, you could build a service catalog that represents a total scope of what an identity could do across these clouds. But it's also important to be able to set up explicit trust. And there's trust as an identity provider from one cloud to another. And then there's trust as a service provider from one cloud to another. And so in this case, cloud one uh, trusts cloud two as a service provider. Um, so that way, any identities authenticating uh, could be given those endpoints surfaced by cloud two. And now on the other hand, uh, the cloud two trusts cloud one as an identity provider. So that way, when it comes across as an assertion, as a token comes across, and it decodes the originating identity provider, it knows where to go back to and trust that that's, that's a solid point or, or originating identity provider point. So when we connect all these together, eventually we start forming this uh, uh, cohesive federation of rebel alliances, right? Where we could speak different protocols to be able to authenticate to a cloud, get access across multiple clouds. Uh, and, uh, and in many cases, there aren't uh, any client changes that are absolutely uh, actually needed. You see Chewbacca right there using the standard username password as they do today and not needing to federate directly into the cloud. OK, right now I'm going to go ahead and turn it off to Brad Topol to talk about what was delivered within the ICE House. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, so getting started here, there is a quote from our fearless PTL. 
Dolph, raise your hand. Where are you? I can't find you. That's amazing. My eyes are terrible. Go ahead and stand up. Dolph, Dolph is uh, who leads us on what we're doing, and, and this is his quote. OS Federation extension allows Keystone to consume federated authentication uh, via an Apache module for multiple identity providers, mapping federated attributes into OpenStack group-based based role assignments. We're going to go through that and actually put that into English. Um, now, the Keystone team, and we've got all the cores there, and we've got um, lots of folks here, we really, really believe in stakeholder-driven development. And we were very lucky that on this particular topic, um, we were honored to have Merrick Denis. Merrick, stand up, please. He is one of those super users that the caricatures are there. Um, Merrick is at CERN. Uh, this was one of their key requirements. And so as the development has been ongoing, you know, you're getting the validation uh, just in classic agile development of, of being able to do this. So thank you, Merrick. And we're going to keep doing that. And for all the stuff that we do in Keystone, um, we love having stakeholders like Merrick. So please, when you have stuff, you should know the right names to contact, Dolph, it's others. We, this is how we like to do this. So please. So here's what we're going to go through and talk about. We're going to talk about the, the new APIs and why you need them. We're going to talk about the magic, which is the mappings. Um, and then after that, I'm going to hand over to one of the, the, the key developers, Steve Martinelli, uh, and he's going to get into some of the, the authentication details and how they're different. Um, uh, one thing to point out is most of you use Keystone. I'm sure you use the, the, the Python Keystone client. We're actively, and actually Merrick has helped coding this, we're actively putting a lot of what we're going to describe here into the client, so that will come soon. It's a work in progress patch. But I'm going to go through and describe things using the existing RESTful APIs. And Merrick, you had a, an existing version of your client that you used for your work, and that'll get into the client uh, hopefully quickly. But what do we need to do here? Well, the first thing we need to do is you're going to have different identity providers. We need to find a way to register them. So very simple RESTful API here to register. You've got a description for your identity provider. You get to give it ID. Um, nice and easy. Similarly, your different identity pro uh, uh, providers can have different protocols. You could have SAML1, SAML2. Again, you know, the classic OpenStack model, we believe in being pluggable and lots of options uh, to, to meet everybody's needs. And so here you can see there's a nice simple API uh, where you can describe the protocol. And you look, you know, classic uh, RESTful API, you, you point out the IDP ID, and then you can uh, have the protocol ID and then, uh, you know, register the values. Um, we're going to get into this in a little more detail. But the magic to making this work is to be able to take the information that comes from the identity provider, typically in the form of things like Samuel assertions, and map them into the Keystone world uh, so that we can do the right things, set folks in the right roles, in the right groups. And the, the magic that there was a lot of work done and, and uh, was to provide a robust, robust mapping layer to accomplish this, and lots of iterations on that, um, and I'm sure it'll continue. But, but, but that's sort of you know, another piece that you need to get registered, and uh, you register it with a mapping ID. OK, so let's kind of level set and, and talk about classic Keystone. I love giving presentations on classic Keystone because the, the model is, is really straightforward. And I you know, get up there and I say, listen, you've got users and you typically map them to projects, they used to be called tenants, via a role. And that role is just a label. And all the other OpenStack projects take that information and they have their own policy engines and that's how they decide whether you're able to kick off uh, an instance or attach storage or whatever you want to do. So that's great and it works, but as we start moving to federated identity, there's a few problems that we're going to have to address. Uh, the first biggest one is, you know, in that model that I just talked about, you had the users, you map them via roles to the projects, the users were in Keystone, they might have been, you know, coming from LDAP, but they were essentially in Keystone. And federated identity, those users are no longer in Keystone. 
uh, kind of makes that original classic mapping a little difficult. So that's one of the big problems that we had to solve. Um, and really what we do is now what's coming from the identity provider is some notion of attribute values typically called assertions. And we're going to take those values and map them to groups. So we, you know, maybe not know exactly who you are, but based on the attributes that you have, we know to put you in a group. And then we can do classic keystone, which is groups have the notion of roles, just like the classic model of, 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 of users. And now we got you in a group and the group's got roles. All the rest of what I described in classic keystone is going to work. So, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have done this, but you can go, this is a little bit ugly, but, uh, you know, here you can create some groups, and down here you've got the, you know, you can put people in different groups, uh, and that's what you're seeing, some examples there. And we're associating the groups with a role. So we're, you know, setting, creating the groups and associating roles on the groups, just like you would just see on users. Uh, I know that's a little hard to read, but that's the big concept there. And now things get a little interesting. We've got the notion of Samuel assertions. And so we've got some examples here. We've got one that for whatever reason has like a, a, a name, a username in it. Um, and then we've got some that were, you know, some attribute values for different types of identity groups. I think that, you know, that's typically the more common case. And so these are the kind of things that are gonna flow from the identity provider that we're gonna need to map into Keystone's world. Um, right now, to create the mapping, uh, there's a, a lot of details on this and, and docs on all the different features. They really worked hard, uh, a lot of iterations to make this very flexible. Um, and we'll continue to improve it. If we missed a few boundary cases, let us know. But the, the idea here is uh, from the remote identity provider, um, there's going to be certain attribute values like I showed on the previous slide. One example was, you know, uh, the type IDP group. And here we've got a mapping that says, hey, if that attribute comes in with the value of IBM Regular Employees Canada, map it to a group ID. And what happens is this information is going to get into the token that's created and that's how the rest of Keystone works to do its roles and, and what have you. Uh, similarly, we've got another one of those down below, but then we've got another one that's interesting, is maybe you need the username. So if any of you know me, um, I'm very big on cloud auditing. Uh, I gave a, a presentation earlier in the week on cloud auditing. You, you're really going to want to know the information coming in from those uh, identity providers to be able to figure out who's getting authorized, what have you. And so we've got a capability here where if the identity provider provides something like uh, subject as the type, which is essentially the username, we can map it in the token to a well-known value in the token called name. And since that value is going to get Pop, uh, populated on, I then get access to it when we plug in our auditing and, and we can uh, keep track of wonderful things like who's getting authorized. Okay, getting in. Uh, I'm going to hand off on the really hard details to Steve Martinelli before he falls off the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Brad. All right, so um, thanks, Brad, for explaining all the mapping portions of the new and the new APIs. But what do we actually want? We want a token back from Keystone. This way, we can use that token uh, to uh, use it in Nova or Cinder or any other OpenStack service. Uh, so really brief, briefly, I'm going to recap uh, what was the old Keystone authentication model. You would have a username and a password. You would uh, authenticate with Keystone and get back an unscoped token, right? Uh, once that happened, you would then go and query uh, to find out what projects or domains you have access to. Uh, once you find out the project that you want, you use that ID for the project along with the unscoped token, and then make a scope token request, get back the scope token, and then you can start using that in uh, Nova or Cinder or what have you. All right, so as Brad already touched up on this, there's one big issue in a federated Keystone environment, and that's that um, the user doesn't exist in Keystone. He exists in an IDP somewhere else. 
So as such, we've had to make a few tweaks, a few new APIs, but we want to keep the process as similar as we can to the old non-federated Keystone process. So we want to keep the unscoped, get the project ID, issue a scope token request. We want to keep that essentially as similar as we can. So part one, uh, we want to get back an, uns an unscoped token. So over here, the user is going to perform a get or a post request on the URL that you see above there. And what's going to happen is the IDP is actually going to go and intercept this request and then prompt the user to log in. And once the user has been authenticated, the IDP is then going to uh, send a SAML assertion over to Keystone, which acts as a service provider in this case, at which point the, uh, once Keystone actually has the SAML assertion, it's got all the data it kind of needs at this point. Uh, if you look at the URL, it's got the IDP, it's got the protocol, and it's got the SAML assertion. You can find the mapping that you want to use that Brad talked about by uh, looking up the IDP and protocol. And then you can put the SAML assertion, all the attributes, you can push them all through the mapping engine. And then in the end, the mapping engine should output uh, group IDs and a username. So you can see over here, uh, we actually go ahead and stick those values into the unscoped token. So you can see over here, the user ID would, would be Steve Marr, and, the, and we have a new OS Federation kind of object there. And we uh, stick the group IDs in there as well. Um, why we want the group IDs is part two. So, Again, keeping with that same non-federated Keystone model, we want to find out what projects and domains we have access to. So we're going to go ahead and use that unscoped token that we just got back from step one, and we're going to use that uh, to query against a few new APIs. Uh, this will then go and look up what, uh, what projects or domains the group has access to. And by proxy, the federated user would also have access to. Um, the output of these uh, things should be very similar, and you'll see them in v3 slash projects or v3 domains. All right. So once we figure out the target project ID or domain ID, we have our own scope token from step one. We have to now scope it. Here we can actually leverage the existing auth tokens URL. And um, it should be pretty much business as usual at this point. We just uh, have to change, I think, the methods portion. We change that to SAML2. But otherwise, it's more or less the same. We keep the scope uh, format the same. We put the project ID in there. And we put the unscoped token ID in the ID value of SAML2. And the output should be a fully functional Keystone token. Um, it's going to have the extra fields that you need, like the user value over there, Oop, forgot to update that, should say Steve Marr. And, um, but otherwise, it should have the project ID there too, and the roles that you have on the project. And it should act as a fully functional Keystone token. You can use it on Nova or Cinder or any other OpenStack service. And um, we're taking that as a success. Um, so this ends the presentation. We're going to talk, we're going to have a few minutes for questions. However, we have additional design sessions coming. As Joe had already talked about, um, Federation's not over. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, we're going to do some cool stuff in Juno, and we have some design sessions coming up today and one tomorrow. Uh, the main one's today at 1.30. It's in room B306. Please drop by. Um, however, I think we're taking a few questions now, right? Yeah. OK, thanks. Adam, come on. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I took notes. Oh, God. Um, OK, first on um, translating what you're saying into English, I'd like to uh, point out that we first had to translate it from the Queen's English. Um, <laughs> I think we all uh, should give a big uh, thank you and round of applause to Professor Chadwick, who started driving this effort. Oh. Six years ago, eight years ago, before OpenStack. Um, so thank you very much for, Absolutely. For, for being a mentor to all of us on this. Agreed, thanks. Um, yeah, I want to just 
uh, make something more explicit that you kind of alluded to and then you said mod shib for now. Um, it actually doesn't have to be mod shibboleth in front of Apache. It has to be something that will pass through environment variables from Apache to the back end. And, and mod shib is what these guys have been working with and made sure that we work. So we know that that works, but um, there are several other um, Apache modules that work in similar ways with other things. And so the federation mechanism is not limited to working with mod shibboleth. There's one to make that explicit, but you did yeah. uh, allude to it. Um, on the PKI thing, um, we can actually pull the signer information out of the token. So okay. I think that's be where we start working on that. Um, and the idea of federate, federated keystone to keystone, um, I think we, we can potentially make happen without having to phone home to the original keystone for every uh, authentication. Um, cool. And then, um, that's uh, actually, I have a question he here that I, uh, you answered afterwards, so good job, guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Good awesome. question. <laughs> Lovely comments. Yes. I had a question about uh, other clients, such as JClouds or uh, Fog. Do we, do we reach out to those communities when we make changes to the Keystone APIs, like, so that they can get caught up with the changes? You mean to the client? Yeah. Um, we obviously, uh, you know, let us know. We want to make sure we're not breaking anybody and give best practices if they're not using the standard client. So um, sure, this was additive in nature, so it wouldn't be breaking uh, JCloud's fogs or or anything like that. But yes, uh, I mean the, it's added functionality, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's added additional functionality. Stuff. So. Okay. Yeah, we have to be there before they can actually start using it. So that it's ready for any JCloud or Fog developer to start picking this up and running with it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Oh, well, oh, um, one more. Up. Uh, will will a V3 federated token work against a V2 Keystone? So it's a standard, uh, the backend validation process for it would still work. I don't think you'll get back the federated context when you validate the token. So in the V3, is that right, Adam? There is no such thing as a V2 V2. So yes, but in the construct of the V2 response, you wouldn't see that that token was federated. So it's not really good for your auditing records to do that. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you have clients that are still using V2 and you have Keystone V3, um, and for some reason you have, your patch hasn't been accepted yet, or you're still using the V2 client, sure, the token is just the same, right? I mean, it's a string at the end. Okay, so if I get a, all right, so if I, if, I, if I manually get a federated token using curl, for example, yep. and then I pass it into a client that's written for a V2, that's not going to work. Yeah. 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 So I think to sum up the answers, um, ideally use V3. If you're going to use V2, it might work. You might run into some weird problems. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Morgan. Hello. I have a question about the um, Keystone to Keystone authentication. In this case, I was wondering uh, why you set the rules for the users in the first case or in the second case, Keystone. And another question is, um, have you thought about the authentication from, not from the command line client, but from a web service, a web server like Horizon or you know, whatever? It's possible to have the Shibboleth authentication in this case? Or does it work? Okay. The uh, first question is, is where does the actual token scope come from when a role is associated to a user? And it's the, wherever the token was issued. So in that, in that diagram that I had, it would be Keystone 1 that initially issued 
that token. Now, what triggered that Keystone wanted to issue the token could have been a federation that occurred with employer provided identity provider, or it could have been just username password being passed into that Keystone one. At that point, the token is scoped to that user, to the roles, and, and, and then it's passed elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yes, but in, in this case, the Keystone one can decide what the user can do on the other clouds, right? Because you decide the roles on the first Keystone. Sure. Jorge. It's quite different from normal. Yeah, you should be able to create mappings that sort of limit the scope of what a user can do between one cloud and another. And to Sorry, the, the, it, it isn't actually there at the moment, isn't the keystone to keystone, but when it will be there, it should be quite easy because the token that's issued by keystone one will go over to keystone two, it will be validated, and then attribute mapping will come in, and it will map it from exactly. keystone one world into keystone two world, and the user will then have his projects for keystone two. Yes. So you have a double map. Yeah. Well, the bit... It, it all depends. If, if he logs in with username okay. and password at Keystone 1, there'll be no necessarily any mapping on Keystone yeah. 1. If he comes in federated, there'll be mapping on Keystone 1, and then there'll be addition mapping on Keystone yeah. 2. And, I, and ideally, to answer your second question, um, we'd, we'd like to be in a world where if you're doing this service provider type federation, you're, you should get a service catalog that includes additional endpoints that may be in another cloud. So from the perspective of Horizon, you know, nothing really changes aside from the fact that you have additional endpoints that you can provision resources into. So the, the part uh, in the slide where we're doing this communication between Keystone kind of hides away some of those federation you know, protocol implementation stuff, and to the user, you just send a request and treat it as if you would anything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I just want to add, this is ongoing, so we really want to work with you to get this right. Exactly. So this is not, you just gave us a few things. Right. Come back to us, you know who we are, and let's do this together so we get it right. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. I'd like to go back to your uh, to the discussion you had about auditing and, and the interest in auditing. So in the uh, in in the case of trying to track uh, a given ac uh, action within the service to a particular user, I think I heard you say that part of the SAML attribute you'd pass over would be the user ID. Or, or username, or yeah, some user identifier. So talk about, okay, so now the, in the SAML attribute, the, the username comes over, but because Keystone doesn't know who that user is, nothing else does either. Uh, so what happens then, right? So the SAML the attribute comes over, gets attributed and, and mapped in appropriately, but how, what do you do with that user ID in order to facilitate the rest of the audit trail? Which identity provider? So we've got an identity provider and a, and a username. And those are things that we could fill in our CADF event record with. Now, if there's something we need to refine on that, that if that's not good enough, um, you need to come talk to us. And we should talk about what we should be adding there so that we make that much easier and, and, and easier to, to have that breadcrumb back to really what happened. I mean, that's the best. That's our straw man. And, but if, if you can help us to think of what's better, uh, please do. So I, maybe I'm missing it, but so it sounds like as part of the CADF aspect, you would, so let's say, you know, I, I use that token to now go create, uh, spin up a new server. Yeah. Uh, does that attribute somehow follow in? Well, it's in the token, right? So it's in the token. We should be able to pull it out and with our standard uh, auditing, be able to say this thing was started up or this thing was attached by this username from this identity provider. I mean, that, that's my current thinking. Okay, and it's just because it's passed this metadata, it's not, it, the metadata doesn't mean anything, but because it's passed along, you can then audit and report on it as, well, it meant something in the context of the original identity provider. Yeah, right. So, so hopefully that's enough. Okay. I now it's TBD to see how well we do there, but but we'll work on it together. Okay. All right. Got you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I saw on the roadmap. I think you had OAuth two. Is the uh, are, are you considering the use case that I should be able to log on to? Oh, I'd like to log on to Horizon using my GitHub credentials. 
Um, so you're talking from a strict use case of delegation for OAuth too, and what we're looking at is OpenID Connect, which is based on OAuth for the actual authentication, federated authentication. Yeah, so if I want to, if I'm interested in or I'd like to work on that use case, is that part of what you're thinking about? Is that something you're open to? Is that uh, in the roadmap? So I would, I would put that under the, a delegation use case as opposed to a federation use case. But yes, it's something that many people are interested in and, and this should be part of Keystone roadmap overall. I think, I think you did describe a federation use case. You said you want to use a credential from a different identity provider to log into okay. a cloud and that is federation. Um, and so yeah, you should be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I imagine I'd have to probably have an account for uh, if it's a, if it's a real cloud where I'm going to use resources that are that are chargeable, I probably have to set up an account somewhere. But you need to set up a relationship yeah. so that they that you know that, and that's an out of bound relationship that's going on yeah. uh, between the two providers. But but if yeah. I set up DevStack and turn on GitHub integration, <coughs> it should be able to just go in. Yeah, that would be cool. Nice. All right, thanks. Okay. We'll wrap it up. No other questions. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.